In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. May the Lord bestow upon us his blessing, mercy, grace, and wisdom. Now and ever into the age, all ages, amen. And welcome back, everyone. We are uh, getting through the book of Song of Solomon, thank God. Um, we're about halfway done, and today, God willing, we'll study uh, chapter four, uh, according to the fathers. Um, regarding this chapter, some commentators consider this discussion after the betrothal um, to, be, to be the honeymoon. Um, either way, it's more of a dialogue of love, as we'll see. Um, it's first the groom details his description of how he sees his bride. Um, and of course, we take this to be of how God sees us, how God sees his beloved um, children. <clears throat> And there's many beautiful and elaborate symbols, um, as we'll see. Um, and not only does it describe the soul in particularly, but more important or more significantly, how he sees us at the time of our baptism or when we rise um, to take on, after we've taken off the old man, to take on the new man. As St. Paul says, as many of you were baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. So as we'll see, he sees us as himself, um, or because we become Christ-like, okay? Um, so um, let's uh, jump in by God's grace. <laughs> um, so the first verse, the Lord says, and he repeats it again, um, a few verses later, he says, behold, you are fair or beautiful, my love, behold, you are fair. Um, and again, in verse 7, he says, you are fair or completely beautiful all over, um, and there is no spot, in it. there's nothing ugly in you. Um, and the fathers teach us this is how God's grace cleanses us and sanctifies us through the sacraments, um, and we become Christ-like, as I just said, right? And um, in the Psalms, which many people take this to be as a psalm relating to the Holy Virgin Mary especially, but... The, the queen or the husband, uh, the, sorry, the, <laughs> the wife of the king um, is also the daughter, and she's all beautiful from within. Um, well, how can she be a daughter and the sp a spouse, right? Um, because we are all children of God, and he considers us his beloved. This is the only explanation for it. Um, <clears throat> and uh, how do we get this cleansing? From him. Um, as, as in 1 John 1, 9, um, the apostle describes what happens after repentance and confession. He cleanses us from all unrighteousness, and there's no spot in us anymore. So when is the time there's no, no sin in us? When he has wiped us away in baptism, and also, as the church fathers explain, the second baptism, which is when we're washed with our tears um, by, and by the grace of God, there's no spot in us after that if we repent and confess in the proper way. So um, after this, he, he continues a detailed description from almost head to toe <laughs> of how beautiful she is in every aspect. And the first thing he starts with is the eyes. Why? Because he's, he's probably gazing into her, her eyes, right? And, and he says something interesting. He says, you have eyes like the dove, um, even though I, you're, you're veiled. You're veiled to everyone else, but not to me, because I'm your groom. Um, and the fathers explain this to say, of course, this is relating to the Holy Spirit. How did the Holy Spirit descend upon the Lord on the day of his baptism like a dove? Um, and so the fathers say we become like him because we are temples of the Holy Spirit, as St. Paul says. Um, another explanation is, we see like the eyes of the dove. We see like the way the Holy Spirit sees, if you have the Holy Spirit inside of you, right? Um, without judging anyone, right? Without, um, we've cast out the, the speck in our eye and the log in our own eye um, so we can see clearly um, as God does. Uh, the last uh, example that the fathers give is, um, you remember in the story of Genesis when uh, after the flood, when Noah's trying to check to see if um, the water has uh, receded from, from the earth, right? So he, he sends out 
um, at one point a dove. And in the beginning, the dove does not find rest. The dove does not, not find peace. So it returns to the bosom of Noah. And so the fathers say, this is um, the, the soul that does not find rest in the world after the waters of baptism, but finds rest in Noah. Noah actually here, the, the name means rest. Um, so we find rest in our beloved um, after uh, being baptized. Um, what is the veil? This is, like we said, um, as St. Paul describes in 2 Corinthians 3, the, those who are not baptized have a veil over their eyes and they can't see God clearly. They can't read the scriptures clearly. They can't understand the truth clearly because we need the Holy Spirit to understand his mysteries. Um, and when we turn to Christ, the, the veil is lifted because our beloved is there and we see him clearly and he knows us clearly. Um, <clears throat> so um, then he begins to describe her hair um, and the father says, this is the humility of the repentant ones. Um, and uh, the Mount Gilead here, there's many explanations, but one is um, it was a place where there was a lot of aromatic bombs and oils, um, uh, and holy oils in a sense. Um, and there are also a lot of pastures because there's not a wilderness. The, uh, where God is, there's always fruit. And then finally, um, if you know the story of Gideon, he was victorious um, on, on Mount Gilead. But before this, God said, I, I don't want to, you to be victorious because of your numbers, but because of my grace. Um, he's, God does not look at the quantity, but the quality. Um, so uh, these are just some commentaries on this part. So we look at the eyes, we look at the hair, um, then the teeth and the mouth, which um, seemingly has no spiritual symbolism, but here it does. Um, as St. Augustine says, um, the, the person who has teeth is no longer a child. They don't, they don't not, they do not longer need um, uh, milk, but solid food. You're, so you're growing here spiritually. Um, and St. Augustine says this refers to the teachers and the ministers and the servants and, and the clergy of the church, um, whose role is uh, to grow spiritually, but also to teach. Um, and then the other example he, here, your teeth are like a flock of shorn sheep. Shorn is, is like shaved. Um, and so this is the, the person who trims off the excess in their life, um, the, the carnality. Um, of the thoughts and the deeds and the desires through the grace of the Holy Spirit, and they take off the burdens of the world and following the commandment. Um, so this is the mature bride, right? Um, and every one of which bears twins. Um, here the twins, again, are explained by when the Lord, so there's several explanations, but when the Lord sent out the disciples two by two, right? Um, he these are the ministers, so that applies to what St. Augustine was explaining regarding the teeth. Um, another explanation is the two things that are needed for the grace of God to take effect in us is being born from water and spirit, uh, the work of grace, as St. Cyril of Jerusalem says. And the last one is um, probably uh, easier, easiest to understand because, uh, as St. Augustine says, um, the two commandments on which hang all the law and the prophets are love for God, number one, and love for your neighbor, right? Um, and if you satisfy these two, you satisfy, in a sense, the whole law. Um, and uh, this is, again, the mature Christian who, who has done this by the grace of God. Then he continues by saying, your lips are like a strand of scarlet, Read here for the blood of Christ, sanctified by the blood of Christ, like Rahab um, was was protected and blessed with the scarlet cord uh, in in her window, um, so that the enemy had no um, uh, power over her, and the and the consequence of sin had passed over her, right? <clears throat> uh, 
um, the temples behind the veil, uh, as some of the fathers say, th these are what reveals the inner thoughts and the inner feelings and the inner heart of joy, sorrow, or trouble. You, um, and the church, um, her uh, deep thoughts, our deep feelings of peace and joy are exposed before her beloved. Um, piece of pomegranate, we'll get into this um, towards the end as well. Um, but just to remind you, in, in the Old Testament, um, in the book of Exodus and Leviticus, God ordered uh, the pomegranates to be placed in the temple in, in First Kings, um, adorned with carving, carvings of pomegranates, but also on where on, on the um, bottom tassel of, of the vestment of the high priest. Um, and uh, so this is a type of adornment or relating to the glory of God, right? Um, not only is it red and s smells beautiful and tastes good, it's good for you. And at the same time, um, it's protected from the outside. So it's hard on the outside, kind of like the symbolism here of uh, the dates. It's hard on the outside. Um, it's actually the opposite, <laughs> where the date has the seed that's hard, hard faith or strong faith on the outside. But here there's a protection for the pomegranate on the outside and the sweet smelling um, uh, fruit on the inside. So the secret of the beauty is the blood of Christ that sanctifies her from within. Um, okay. Uh, moving along, your neck is like the Tower of David built for an armory on which a thousand bucklers are all shields of mighty men. Um, so what is this about? Well, the neck here is the deep faith that, that in a sense, um, uh, helps the head uh, be uh, elevated strong. Um, and the Tower of David, uh, we're not exactly sure what this is referring to. Um, there, there was something called the Tower of David but actually that came after uh, King, King Solomon, um, as some commentators say. But this is more relating to the strong faith and the love for God, as, as David had to be victorious over Goliath. But back in the day when, um, when there was a city um, or um, a general or a leader who was very victorious in battle, they would take the shields of the soldiers and place them on the tower um, for a, a few reasons, but mainly to, to show their um, victory, to show their valor and, and bravery. Um, and even uh, King Solomon um, used to um, overlay the, uh, the shields here with gold. Um, and so, um, this was also kind of like a, our protection is uh, is very not only valuable but it lasts long because gold does, doesn't rust and it comes from God. Um, so again, th this is the meaning of the likening the neck to the Tower uh, of David. <clears throat> Moving a few verses uh, past this, now the bridegroom. Uh, speaks and says, okay, I need you, like he said before, to rise. I need you to come with me. Um, come with me from Lebanon um, and uh, and look from the top of Amena, Sinir, and Hermon, which were mountains of Lebanon, from the lion's den, from the mountains of the leopards. Um, so some commentators say that here Lebanon um, refers to um, not only the high place, um, but it was compared to Jerusalem, probably a little more luxurious. So some people say this is kind of like the, the honeymoon. Okay, we need to, after you celebrate the marriage and you're rejoicing in the honeymoon in a far luxurious place, you do what? You come back and you start the real life, um, which involves a lot of sacrifice and, um, and effort. Um, so we need to leave the Lebanon, the honeymoon, and start the work, the fight, the struggle, carry the cross with him. 
um, and adapt to the new lifestyle of the room, which is carrying the cross and taking off the old man. St. Cyril of Alexandria, he says, this teaches us the bride's place of origin. So Lebanon, of course, was not from the people of God in the Old Testament, um, and that it was full of idols. So now he, he's saying, okay, even though your place of origin was not the proper worship of God, come with me. Um, uh, come with me and and uh, without knowing the law, uh, you, it's okay. You, but now you're taught the mystery of Christ. Um, and so uh, in, the, in the past, you were in a far, far, cold, lofty, dangerous place, but come with me and I'll protect you and provide for you. Even though there's lion's dens around you, like with, with Daniel, uh, I will protect you. Um, <clears throat> so uh, yes, there will be temptation and tribulation, but with your beloved, there's nothing to fear. Uh, now he, he continues to say, I, I, can't, um, I can't bear the love that I have with you, just like the spouse said, or the bride said a, a few chapters ago, um, I'm lovesick, right? So here he's saying, you ravished my heart, um, my sister, my spouse. With one, just one look of your eyes, um, uh, you inflamed the desire of, of love that I have for you. Um, so oftentimes you say this is this is the uh, speech of the soul or us towards Christ, but he, he also feels the same way about us. Uh, it's amazing when you think about it. Um, and St. Cyril says, truly you inflamed us with desire for you by one word of confession with you rightly possessed, seeing uh, with your interior eyes. Um, and he, he later on goes to say, you know, this is um, the words of the angels who, who witness the, the beautiful um, relationship between um, humanity and the Lord God, which they don't have the same relationship with. Um, I don't want to say they're jealous. They, there's no negative um, emotions in, in heaven, but um, they're, uh, they can't... Um, they can't fathom the depth of, of the relationship between humanity and, and God. Another thing is, um, as some of the fathers say, um, with one look of our eyes towards God in prayer, um, he is um, overcome uh, by, by our needs. Um, as the psalmist says in 11th hour, unto you lift up my eyes, O you who dwell in heavens. Behold, as the eyes of his servants look to the hand of their masters, so our eyes look to the Lord our God until he has mercy on us. Um, so, so we're begging for mercy from the Lord, and it ravishes his heart. Um, and of course, he, he, he is not um, ignorant of our needs and our desires and our looks. <laughs> uh, the only question is sometimes he, he doesn't answer immediately, um, but he still feels for us, um, which is important for us to recognize when, when we don't get that answer immediately um, or we don't get the solution um, of, of our problems um, apparent for us from, from the first prayer. Then he continues again to say, how, how beautiful is your love? How for my sister, my spouse, how much better than wine is your love? Um, and the scent of your perfumes than all spices. Um, <clears throat> and uh, St. Ambrose says, um, Christ then feeds his church with these sacraments by means of which the substance of the soul is strengthened and seeing the continued progress of her grace, he rightly says to her how fair. Um, is your love. So, so God notices our growth, and he notices that when we're partaking of the sacraments, especially repentance, confession, communion, right, we're growing in his grace, and, and he's tracking our growth. Um, and that's why he's saying, um, uh, your love is, is, is beautiful. Uh, also, uh, Buna Tedros Melody, in his commentary, he says, it's, it's amazing how uh, God is praising us. Like 99% of the time in the church when we speak about praise, it's about man's praise 
our praise towards God. <laughs> but here he's praising us, which doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. Um, so he says, amazing are the Lord's praises to us, although all the love we have for him is, is a reflection of his love for us and of his love in us. And all that we have of sweet fragrance are the fruits of his fragrance working in us. All that we have is, is yours uh, when we speak to God. Um, it is astonishing that he gives us all what we have, and he gives us the credit for it, <laughs> um, praising us and rewarding us for it. And although it doesn't make any sense, but the only explanation I have for this is maybe um, God does this not only out of love for us, but for us to just recognize how much he loves us and he'll do anything for us to just be convinced that he loves us and, and give an excuse to, to love him back. Um, so this is the infinite love. Um, okay. Um, next verse, again, <laughs> with, with uh, the description here, uh, the groom says, your lips, O my spouse, drip as the honeycomb because out of the mouth brings forth praise, right? Honey and milk are under your tongue, just like um, the Israelites were going to a land flowing with milk and honey, um, filled with the grace of God, say, well, when we speak the words of God, those are the words of grace. And not only reading the word of God, like in the Psalms, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey in my mouth. Um, God's words are sweet. But the, the believer who is filled with the words of God, also when they speak, um, they, they bring grace to, to others, believers and, and non-believers as well. And so um, we spread this word of God um, by our, our good deeds, by our good words, um, if truly, in fact, we are trying to live according to um, the, the word of God. Um, even, like, for example, um, St. John Chrysostom, uh, they called him the golden mouth. Why? Because when he spoke, you, you can tell God is speaking through him because he was um, enveloped with the word of God constantly in his mind and in his heart. Uh, St. Athanasius used the same thing. When, when he used to speak, uh, others would say, okay, when you're going to listen, write things down. If you don't have any paper, use your clothes <laughs> um, because... You shouldn't let one of these words, you know, fall to the ground. Um, so that's why it's 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 from the tongue. Um, why is it under the tongue here? Um, to show that well, not everyone understands the the only it's it's only for the believer to understand the mysteries. So even sometimes when you come to speak to someone who is not a believer or not living the true faith, um, they, they don't get it. They don't want to get it, or they mock it, right? Because it's it's still there's still a veil, like we said, um, and so that's why some of these things are hidden treasures um, from from those who still don't have the grace of God yet. Um, okay, then another. Um, at first, it seems a complicated um, symbol here, but still filled with uh, beautiful analogies and, and symbolism. Um, a garden enclosed is my sister, my spouse. So now he's likening us to a closed garden or a shut spring or a sealed fountain. All of these things are referring to the same um, type of uh, secrecy or mystery um, like we explained before between the bride and the groom. Um, but here St. Cyril also says this garden um, that is closed is our, to the world, it's open to the groom. So, yeah, my heart is closed to the world, and, and my, my spiritual relationship with God is, there's a lot of it that is done, you know, behind closed doors. Um, and the fountain that we were anointed after baptism is sealed by the Holy Spirit, right? So we're, we're protected by the, the, the commandments and by living um, the, the holy uh, scripture in our life. But we're a garden because we bear fruit. We bear the fruit of the Spirit. Um, it starts with the cross. It starts bitter, just like the fruit when it's growing. Um, it, it, it tastes bitter if it's not ripe. But once it's ripe, it bears fruit, 36, 800 fold. 
So in the beginning of the spiritual life after baptism, or um, when we're trying to grow, yes, we're carrying the cross. Um, we have tribulation, um, but the sweet fruit will, will come in the perfect time, in due time. St. Ambrose also says um, here with the closed garden and the spring that is shut and the, the, the fountain that is sealed, he signifies that the mystery um, ought to, sorry, it's a, mis, a mistake here, um, ought to remain sealed with you, uh, that it shouldn't be violated by the deeds of an evil life. Your guardianship is the faith out therefore to be good, that integrity of life and silence may endure and blemish. So um, we have to work with the grace of God that is instilled in us. And um, if we just assume that we are saved and not work out our salvation in fear and trembling, then, um, then we're not closing up the garden. And what happens to a garden that is not anything that is not um, fenced in, well, it's, it's prone to um, animals, it's prone to burglars, um, it's, it's not protected. Um, so we can lose that grace of God. Um, we're not saved in the, in the moment. Um, and, and we're saved through baptism, but we have to preserve our baptism by, by keeping ourselves unspotted from the world as best as we can. Okay, so finally, in the last few verses, um, he begins to describe a lot of spices um, and, and sweet smelling uh, fruits and, and oils. We don't have time to go into the depth of each one, but that's, that's kind of like the theme. Um, and it's mentioned again more than once in this book. But just a, a few pointers here of, uh, just to show you. When he says, your plants are an orchard of pomegranates, fragrant henna with spikenard and saffron, calamus and cinnamon with all trees of frankincense, myrrh and aloes with all the chief spices. Um, so we'll, pomegranate, we already described this. It's tough on the outside, but sweet on the inside, right? And it's red, like the blood of Christ. Um, and um, the henna is also red, like the sacrifice. And as you know, one of the Middle Eastern traditions is, is to uh, anoint the bride on the eve of her wedding with this henna, right? Um, just like Christ was crucified for us, or he gave us his blood on the night before his crucifixion, where he wed himself to the church or died for the church. Um, and the spikenard was also, he was anointed with a few days before his burial. Um, and the Lord uh, remembered the woman who did this, right? So this is the, and this spikenard, if, if you remember, it's very costly. Um, from the highest mountains, um, uh, the Himalayas uh, is, is one uh, popular location. Um, and it was offered out of love um, for the crucified groom. Um, and then the saffron and the calamus and the cinnamon, they're sweet smelling. They're used in, in, in not only to spice food, but they were also medicinal in, in property. And um, some of them are, were used for anointing, like the cinnamon was used for, I believe, anointing um, Aaron in the book of Exodus. And also it's used in the Holy Myrun, um, which the, the patriarch and the bishops uh, prepare um, when, when we're running low. They, they renew the batch. Um, and there are a lot of uh, spices and uh, oils um, that are prepared for, for this uh, or, and some of, some of them are mentioned here, but cinnamon is, is one of them. Marin Frankensis, we already explained um, last time, but maybe I didn't explain that they, they're bitter to the taste, but the sweet smelling aroma, just like the cross. It's bitter to, to, to be crucified, but it's a sweet smelling aroma to God uh, and to the world. Um, so uh, again, there's a lot of allusions here to, to the cross and to the resurrection. Um, which is not a mistake. Finally, the bride speaks. <laughs> and she says, Awake, a north wind, and come, O south. Blow upon my garden that its spices may flow out. Um, let my beloved come to his garden and eat its pleasant fruits. 
So she's asking here for the wind. What is the wind if we look in the Old Testament um, and we look in the, the, the Greek language and, and the Hebrew, it, it's the same word for spirit. Um, so we're asking for the spirit to come um, so we can bear the fruit of the spirit, like we said before. And, and she's speaking to the spirit. She's speaking to the wind. Um, uh, and we say, do, do not take your Holy Spirit away from me, like we say in, in the third hour of the day. She's recognizing also, notice here, that she belongs to her groom. Why? She says, um, the first time she says, blow upon my garden, that its spices may flow out. But then she says, let my beloved come to his garden. So if you remember a few verses, um, uh, sorry, in, in chapter 2, verse 16, um, where she says, my beloved is mine and I'm his. So I no longer own myself, but I'm offering to my bridegroom and I, I belong to him. Um, so that's why she says, let my beloved come to his garden. Let him do what he wants with me. Um, and I'm bearing fruit for his sake. This is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And, and I can't do anything good um, without him. So these are some just nice contemplations on the various verses uh, in this chapter. Um, as, as you see, there's, there's plenty that we didn't go into. Um, but we're just giving you a little sample of how um, spiritually rich these uh, symbols are. Uh, not only describing our responsibility as Christians to live a holy life, but also how great God loves us and desires us to be with him um, forever. Um, God willing, next time we'll uh, continue um, with uh, chapter 5. Uh, and glory be to him now and forever into the age of the